Today's lesson focuses on the concepts that we see in Worksheet 2, primarily frequency histograms and bar graphs. Now, the first thing that I want to make sure we understand is the difference between a bar graph and a histogram. A bar graph is used when we have categories for our data. They are non-numerical, such as jobs or sports. Uh, we can talk about different brands, but the different groupings for the graph all represent categories. Quantitative variables, such as numerical values like salary or ages, um, number of hours earned at a college, things of that matter that are numerical are going to fit into a histogram. So whenever you're trying to figure out what type of graph to make, ask yourself if the data that's being represented is numerical or categorical. A frequency chart refers to the number of entries in each category or interval. The term frequency just refers to how many times the entries appear in the category or interval. First, we're going to talk about a categorical variable. In this first example, we are discussing the total count of cases of soda sold in 1999. We have different brands, and as you can see, we have the frequencies of pop sold. We also talk about the proportion. So the proportion is going to be the percent total. So if we wanted to figure out our proportion, we would have to add up all of the millions of cases of soda, and then once we knew how many millions of cases of soda were sold, then we could go ahead and we could figure out the percentage or proportion for that market. If you take a look at the graph below, we can see the difference of, we can see what a bar graph looks like versus a histogram. In a bar graph, we can see that our bars do not touch, okay? We are going to use a straight edge when we graph these in class. I know on the iPad it's difficult to make straight lines, uh, so do the best that you can, but I do expect to see straight lines, and I don't want to see your bars touching. Notice that there are labels along both of the axes. We label the category, so in this case company, and then the numerical values, so cases sold in the millions, and then we have the bars for each different category shown. Now when we want to answer questions about our data, uh, we refer to our chart as well as our graph. The first question asks for the total number of cases sold. To figure this out, we would add up all of the cases that we see in our left column, and we get 9,930, and because our data was in millions of cases, then we have 9,930 million cases of soda. Now you could also, you know, say that's 9 million, etc., but uh, make sure that if you leave the answer as 9,930, that you include the million with it. Now, how many cases were not Pepsi or Coke? In this case, because there are several small little categories, and the Pepsi and Coke are the big categories, what I would do is I would look up here and I'd say, okay, these top two represent Coke and Pepsi. Therefore, if I take one minus the 0 0.441 and minus 0 0.314, then I can get the rest of the percentage. And I see that the rest ends up being 0 0.245. In example two, I have shown what my bar graph looks like. Notice that it is not perfect, however it is neat. It is neat and it shows labels for the different categories. So down here in the bottom, I can see that we are talking about the fields of study. On the left-hand side, I see that the numerical value is percentages of females earning a doctorate. And typically, all of the information that you need to label your graph is going to be found in the title describing your data chart. From there, I have six different categories, therefore I have six different bars. And that's all that we really need to make this bar graph. Again, notice that my bars are not touching because my data is categorical and not numerical. In this next example, we are going to start talking about how we handle quantitative or numerical variables. Frequency tables are very helpful to kind of put the different data into intervals, which we call classes. So as you can see, this data represents the age of U.S. presidents when they were inaugurated. And, you know, most of the presidents were in the range of 40 to 70, and rather than having to put them all in order, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at them in terms of their numerical classes. For example, presidents that are ages 40 to 45, or 45 to 50, and pay close attention to, it, to the way that these classes are done. The first number is inclusive, and the second number is not. So when we see somebody who is age 65, for example, they would be counted in the bottom category and not the one above it. So as we go through, we can see 57 would go right here, 61 would go here, 57 would go here, and we can slowly go across our chart 
and every time we get four, we're going to cross it off into a five until we have finished completing all of our precedents. When we are all done, we should verify that we have 44 precedents in total. So all of these numbers here should add up to equal 44. After we have the correct frequencies, we can then figure out their proportion. So for example, my first class is going to have two precedents. Therefore, the proportion would be 2 divided by 44, which gives me 0 0.045. Complete the frequency and proportion table and then unpause the video. All right, as we can see here, we have all of our presents and they add up to 44 presents and all of our proportions should add up to one. Now we might be off by just a little bit because of rounding. However, that is the number that we are looking for. Now in terms of which class has the most entries, we can see that the ages 50 to 55 has the most entries. So we would say 50 to 55. How many presidents were 50 or older at the time of inauguration? We would go ahead and we would add up all of these numbers. So 13, 12, 7, and 3, giving us 35 presidents. And then lastly, what proportion of presidents were younger than 50 at the time of inauguration? Well, if I had 35 that were 50 or older, and I know that I have 44 presidents total, then that means that 44 minus 35 gives me 9 presidents that were younger than 50. However, it doesn't ask how many, it asks what proportion. So I need to take 9 divided by 44, and that gives me 0 0.205 again after we round to three decimal places. The next data chart that we are going to talk about today is a histogram. And a histogram displays frequencies of quantitative variables. Again, quantitative means numerical. So when variables have a numerical value, a histogram displays the frequencies or how many numbers fit into that category. This is not the same as a bar graph. Um, some of the key differences, first of all, the bars touch each other. Second of all, the horizontal axis is a number line. So if you look down at this graph that we have here for the ages of presidents at inauguration, notice that this scale looks similar to how any graph that we would have graphed in algebra. It is not going to be labeled like this. So I do not want to see you labeling 35 to 40 and 40 to 45. That is not what I want you to do. I will not be happy if you do that. And then again, just recall that each bar represents the values that are greater than or equal to the lower limit and less than the upper limit. So you can think of it in terms of something like this. So 40 to 45, the bracket means it includes 40, the parenthesis means it does not include 45. Example 5 walks us through uh, a recap of everything we've learned so far. So this represents the test um, reading ability in children, and we have scores for 24 students. First, we want you to go ahead and create a frequency chart, um, breaking these students into the different classes, and then figure out their proportion. Once you've done that, we want to figure out the mean, median, and range for this data set and answer the following questions. After you have figured out your frequency chart, um, unpause the video and make sure it is correct before continuing. Below we can see our frequency chart for our students' test skills, and again we want to make sure that the frequencies head up to 24 and that the proportions add up to approximately 1.0. Now in order to find the median, we will need to order the data. To get our range, we can simply subtract uh, the low score from the high score, and to get our mean, we will add them all up and divide by 24. Next, we can go ahead and take a look at what we get for our mean, median, and range. Again, check your scores. If your numbers are wrong, chances are you misadded something or you skipped a number when you ordered them for your median. Now, when we're asked in question 8, the proportion of students who scored less than 30, again, here we would want to look at all of the classes from the top four, or all the students in the top four classes. Students who scored equal to 30 would have been in the 30 to 35 category. Now, the last question we ask you to do is to create a histogram. Now, remember, when you make a histogram, things that we want to look for are that, number one, the bars are touching, and number two, that your x-axis is labeled like a number line. So, I mean, for example, it should look like 10, 15, 20, 25, 
as opposed to writing 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and so on. Create your histogram and then unpause the video and check your graph. All right, as you compare your graph to mine, again, I want you to notice that I don't expect your lines to be perfect. I know it is hard to draw straight lines on the iPad, as you can see by my last bar right here. Um, however, I am going to look for, do your bars touch? Did you try to make it reasonably neat? Uh, is your scaling approximately the same distance apart? And then this other thing that I have here, that's, this is a notation that people will use if your number line doesn't start counting from zero. In this case, it's not necessary now that I look at my graph because it goes 0, 5, 10, 15. However, if my first score had been maybe a 20, then I would want to use that little hash mark to show that I had skipped some numbers and I had removed part of my graph. All right, that's it. Homework is worksheet 2. Have a nice day.